Hello and welcome to the phase of the leather mask making process where we'll be transferring this lovely mask pattern here to leather. Now what you see here is a single shoulder of leather that is 8 ounces in weight. That's the standard weight that I use for making masks because it's not too thick, not too thin. And you'll also see there a paper pattern. They sell some special plastic transfer paper but I just prefer copy paper because it's simple and I have easy access to it and it doesn't tear if you don't press too hard. Anyways, it's uh, printed on an inkjet printer so it's nothing special, just copy paper and inkjet printer. I compose my patterns in Photoshop and to create that first pattern to fit a face, I just did it with trial and error. You can hold the pattern up to your face in the mirror and kind of check to make sure that it fits. At any rate, you also see a pin and a bowl of water and I'm about to show you what I'm going to do with that. Now the trick to transferring this pattern onto the leather is that the leather has to be damp to be receptive to any kind of patterning or impressions. So to do that, well if you don't dampen it first, when you try to transfer this the indents won't stay. They'll be too shallow for you to see. So the first thing you do is you take your sponge with the tap water and just dampen the space like so. You try to get a space that is, try to dampen an area that's about as large as your mask. This is a pretty large mask. And you can tell leather is damp because there's a change in color, it gets darker. I get these tips. Alright, and uh, wait for that water to get sucked into the leather. Basically, once it's not shiny anymore, that means it's ready for you to transfer. Same goes for when you're tooling your designs. Now, I also have a cutting board underneath just to bear down on. And here is where you transfer with your pin. This is just a normal ballpoint pin. And uh, you'll notice that I made the design blue so that I could see when I'm transferring, I'll be drawing black over the parts that I've transferred. So here we go. Alright, voila! As you can see, our pattern is now transferred to the leather. And now we get to cut the pattern from the leather. And for that you need these, which are special leather shears. If you try to cut leather with regular scissors, you will just hurt your hand and probably dull your scissors. So these are, I believe, the craft tool scissors that you can buy from Tandy's website. And they're made especially for cutting through this thick leather basically just cut around the main area and you'll do all that detail cutting with another knife later on. For now you just want to cut out your main shape. Yeah, 
and ta-da! You have your main shape. Now we're ready to cut the mask out from the leather. So that means getting all of these spaces out from beneath the details of this mask. And I've already cut out some here. And what you'll need is a cutting board to bear down on. They sell these vinyl cutting boards at Tandy Leather and most craft stores. Uh, you'll need this angle head utility knife, heavy duty. And I prefer this angle headed knife because it's just easier on your wrists, more so than exacto knives, I find. You can store your blades in the handle, and when you're done with them, you can uh, store them, the used blades here, so you can throw them away safely. And you always want to keep fresh blades on hand because you want to make clean cuts and you can't do that with a dull blade so when this goes dull, goes dull after a few cuts you want to put in a new blade. So here we go and some beginning safety tips for cutting out leather. You want to always cut away from yourself, never cut towards your fingers and never cut towards the inside of your project if you can help it. Always try to cut away from the project so you won't end up overcutting and messing up the details here. And you always want to take it slow with cutting out leather too because it's very easy to go too fast and end off end up cutting off something that you didn't want to cut off. So here we go. And here we have the mask with the outer details cut out of it. Now comes the very hard part, which I still have problems with after our, the years that I've been doing this, the eye holes. Now this, I almost always change blades for, so let's change blades, because we want it to be extra sharp for this. So. I still find cutting out eye holes is a bit of luck and elbow grease. So to get this eye hole out, I always start in the corner and press down. Very slowly move your project as you cut. And I always stop at the middle here so I don't cut all the way around and then end up overcutting on the other corner. So that's when you turn and start at the other corner. So you're cutting inwards. I just find this easier. This is my method of doing it. Prevents overcuts. And there we go. The top part of the eye hole's out. Now we just have to get the rest. And now we have the completely cut out mask. Now
Next, we're going to clean up these edges a bit. Right now, they're kind of squared off, and that's not a very clean edge. So what we're going to do is bevel the edges. I like to do this first, just in case the design of my mask goes all the way to the edge. And I don't want to like cut off that design with a bevel. So essentially what you're doing when you bevel is you're cutting off the square edge so it has a nice slant. And I'm using a number two edge beveler to do this. And uh, they sell them in different sizes for different thicknesses. This is the one that works for eight ounces. So what you do is you just start at the corners again of the eye hole and angle. You get this little sliver that you're cutting off. And I do it just like I cut it out. I stop in the middle and I go around and go from the corner. I just find this easier. basically going all the way around the eye so that's that's one side you've also got to do the other side from the back to make a completely beveled edge and if you do, if you hold your edge beveler at the wrong angle, it won't cut. You'll essentially end up digging into the leather, and it won't let you move. So you'll know you're at the right angle if you're able to cut smoothly like this and get the little sliver of leather out. So now we've cut the edges out of the eyes. I'll have to clean this one up a bit compared to these still square edges of the outside of the mask. But I'm about to take care of that now. And after all that, you end up with a bunch of this stuff. I don't know, I'm still find, trying to find a use for this stuff. Don't know what. Maybe I can pack Easter baskets with it. And the next step will be to tool our design. Now that our mask has been beveled, we're ready for the next phase of the production, which is to tool these designs in so that they stand out more and have some dimension to them. And for that, we'll need, uh, well, first off, we're using a, the vinyl mat again to bear down on. Just protects your tabletop surface. Here we have the swivel blade. This one has a ceramic tip, and I like the ceramic tips because you don't have to sharpen them as much as the metal ones. You can just drop them, and I'll show you guys how to do that. You'll also need a bowl of water. That's to dampen your leather with, you'll see. 
and a sponge to dampen the leather with. I also have a piece of cardboard here to strop with and it's been infused with Jewelers Rouge. It's this chalk type substance that basically infuses the cardboard and has a creates an abrasive surface for you to sharpen with. So you can see I've already sharpened a metal tip on here and that's that silver you see is from the metal that's been uh, used during stropping. So first off to strop, you take your cardboard and you can use a business card for this even, but I'm just using a cardboard. You can use the backs of old art pads to do this which I have a ton of those lying around since I'm also an artist. So you just infuse your cardboard with the Jewelers Rouge. Looks kind of like chalk. Then you take your blade and at a 45 degree angle just slide it down. And you always do the same number of movements on each side of your blade. You try to maintain the same angle of scraping for each side. And I always do this before I start each mask just so your designs are very cleanly cut. And the great thing about the ceramic tips is that they'll sharpen as you use them too. They're very handy that way. And uh, the corners are nice and sharp. So you can do it again. And now we're ready to go. Now first thing you do to start tooling is you have to dampen it because otherwise the leather won't hold the design. If you soak the leather, or dampen it rather, you get these impressions that last a lot longer. And you can see that it's ready to tool when it's not shiny anymore the water has sucked into the surface and you're left with uh, just that brown. So the way you hold the swivel blade is it has a stirrup here for your index finger so you hold it like that. And you're basically putting the tip in the sharp corner and dragging it towards yourself. So you can see there the difference between a cut and uh, just the line from when we transferred it. The cut that I've made is much deeper. So you basically make sure it stays damp because if you try to cut it while it's dry you'll also dull your blade. And if you try to cut it while it's too wet you might your blade might slip around so Got to wait for the water to get soaked in and then you can keep tooling. So now I'm just cutting in all the basic designs. And now you can see that Now for this next phase, to bring some dimension to these lines, you'll need a rawhide mallet, 
or a polymer mallet if you have that instead. That's the cheaper option. And bevel stamps. You can see that they just have a slanted edge and that's to uh, stamp a nice slanted edge into the design to make it have a raised appearance. You're basically working by pushing down the leather so that part of it looks raised. It's like embossing pretty much. And for the finer areas where your stamps can't reach into, you can use a modeling spoon here. It also has a stylus in for really getting into the fine areas. And if you can't afford all the swanky tools like that yet, you can use a pin cap for doing this part. But I went ahead and got the modeling spoon. I found it at Hobby Lobby. And you know Hobby Lobby with 40% off coupons every week. They have other leather tools as well if you want to save some money. Or you can check out eBay. People put, on, put tools up on there all the time. So now, to get a raised edge, you still have to wet it, dampen it, just like before, wait for the water to get sucked into the surface. And if you get too much water on there, you can kind of wipe it off like that. And now, you just place the edge of your stamp at the start of your design and kind of use your pinky to keep your design in place and just tap You're ever so slowly moving the stamp towards yourself and I'm not hammering very hard I'm just tapping very lightly this is not something you want to do at 2 a.m. while your neighbors are uh, trying to sleep Oh, and I'm using a bevel stamp that is size B197, and also I have a smaller one here for smaller spaces that's B203, just in case you want to know what sizes I'm using. So now you can see how I've stamped this area in and how different that looks from this area. It just gives it a nice professional looking finish. So now I get to do that on every area I want to have a little raised dimension to. So here we go.
And now our mask is ready for the next phase. So here we are, we're ready to bake the mask now that it has been tooled. It's ready to be shaped into a mask instead of an angry pancake. So we have a bin of water here that's just full enough to cover the mask. And the stove, or rather the oven, is preheating at 125, 150. It's the lowest temperature setting I have available on my oven. You definitely don't want to bake the mask too high because then you risk them being brittle and stiff. So before you put it in the oven, you submerge the mask. And you probably can't hear it, but it's sizzling. It sounds like sizzling. It's fizzing because there are tiny air bubbles trapped inside of the hide. Let's see if I can get a good shot of that. So what you want to do is you want to wait until these air bubbles are gone. Wait till they're done escaping the hide. That way when you bake it, the water will be evaporating and hardening your mask. This is basically the process to harden your mask so it holds its own shape. So it's about ready to go in now. So here's my oven. It's preheated to 150, which is the lowest setting that's on the oven. And I like to line the oven with this baking paper, which is it just basically keeps the mask from getting the grill lines on it. And here's my mask. It's all floppy and weird. Uh, it got a little dye sp spilled on it earlier. Accidents can and will happen <laughs> no matter how long you've been doing this. So you just kind of flop it in there on top of the paper. And bake for five minutes. And I just keep baking at five minute intervals till the mass starts to firm up. I like to check it a lot because I'm neurotic about it getting burnt. So let's just wait patiently. All right, time's up. Time to get the mask out for the first time. It's still floppy and weird and it's still warm, but this is how I get shaped to the mass. And hello, I know I've been a disembodied hand throughout this whole video, but this is me. Oh, it's very nice. It's very exfoliating. And the most important thing you're doing during this phase here is you're pinching the nose, because if you don't pinch the nose, it's not going to be a very comfortable mask. So just kind of work it, bully it into shape. See how I'm pinching the nose there? So you just pinch it. And continue forming it to your face. Since my face is a bit small, I have a generic male head here that I got from the hobby store. And you can even use this to kind of help model the mask. And I want to start bringing some shape to these sun rays too, so you just bend it with your fingers. And if you want a really sharp crease, you can come back behind it and uh, drag an edge to bend the leather around that edge. But for now, I'm just going to use my fingers. They're attached to me, they're easy to find. It's a tool I can't lose, hopefully. So just forming up these sun rays. 
and not to rush too much, but you want to do this before your mask completely dries. So kind of rush, but don't rush too much. You want to make sure you do it right. See, I'm just forming up these sun rays. And something to be aware of is that masks will dry in the extremities first. So these tips, you want to get them molded first before anything. You want to be sure you get them molded because they're going to dry in the oven a lot faster than everything else. And they're also very prone to burning, so keep an eye on your tips. Alright, so here's how it's looking so far. Crazy, right? Now back into the oven it goes to get a little more firmed up. Five more minutes. And if you want to prop your mask up, you can use more of the baking paper and prop it up. But don't use foil because if you use foil, it'll convect heat right into your mask and it will burn. So baking paper is the safest thing I can recommend at low temperatures. But uh, don't use it at high temperatures because it will uh, catch on fire. So low temperatures only and uh, no foil. Now to wait. Well, it seems like the mask is hardened, holding its shape well. It baked for about 15 minutes and now it is ready to color. Now the kind of dye I use is a uh, echo flow dye. It's a water soluble dye and I always like to use this as the first coat on any mask because it protects the surface. It also uh, adheres to the surface in a way that acrylic doesn't because when you put acrylic on your mask if you layer it too thickly it could crack. So I like to start off with the thinner dye first and this dye also comes in many colors if you'd rather just use dye instead of using acrylic paints. I just find that using acrylic paints, if you apply thin layers, you can get so many range of colors and textures. So, first layer, black dye or midnight black is the color I'm using. And another reason to dye your mask first is that you can see that it's this flesh tone here are the tips where I didn't spill dye on it earlier. It's this flesh tone and you don't want that showing through the later layers of paint. So that helps give you a nice base coat to work on top of for a nice contrast. I also have wax paper here to protect my work surface. So to begin, you dampen your sponge so it has a little give and it isn't stiff anymore. And you just put some dye on your sponge. You can see it's kind of wiggly and gel-like. EcoFlow is very gooey. And you just dab and move in circular motions so you don't get a brush stroke. And that's why I use a sponge because it doesn't leave any prominent brush strokes the way a brush would. It's also cheaper than buying a lot of disposable wool daubers, which is what you're supposed to apply dye with if you go by the traditional method. But I'm cheap, and so are sponges. So I use a sponge. It's also reusable, so that makes it even better. And you want to be sure that you don't get any of this stuff on the back of your mask because it can wear off on your mask wearer's face and you really don't want that. So try to be careful about not getting any on the back side. But if you do get some on the back side, you can just scrape it off with a skiver or shave it off with a sandpaper, just rub it off.
you kind of have to apply the, the uh, dye thickly where you've got a lot of texture so it'll get into the little nooks and crannies of your design. And um, basically the more layers of dye you put on, the darker this coating is going to look. You can even wipe off some of this dye while it's still wet for a cool antique effect. But I'm just going for a uh, uniform coat here just to get an underpainting down. Well, and that about covers it. The masks just need to dry and then it will be ready for the next application of acrylic color. And for cleanup, just rinse out your sponge with soap and water and toss your gloves. And I have plenty of these gloves because they come out of hair dye boxes, so you can just use uh, the extra gloves you get with your hair dye. Or just go get them from the hardware store, they're easy to find. Now that the black dye is dry, we're ready for the next step, which is to apply some acrylic coloration. And because this is a sun mask, I'm going to go all gold, like a beaten metallic gold for this. And I have a paintbrush, which is basically a cast off watercolor brush. It's just a, a synthetic bristle, which synthetic is nice because the bristles are stiff and uh, that works good for using acrylics on leather I'm getting into the nooks and crannies got my paint water I'm also using for gold I'm using Liquitex heavy body paints and these are nice because they're, the paint is flexible so if your, ma your mask is flexing a little bit the paint won't crack and that's a problem usually when the paint is applied too thickly We've finished adding all of the paint and the paint has dried, so now it's time to varnish, which is the final phase of getting this mask ready to wear. And for this step, you will need varnish. This is Liquitex acrylic varnish. This is a satin finish. And I like the satin finish because it's more of a semi-gloss. It's not too shiny, not too flat or matte. And uh, the reason I like that is because, say, you have some matte black in this but you also have metallic gold and the satin allows you to see that contrast between matte and metallic now if you use all glossy it just makes everything glossy and there's no contrast so that is why I like the satin varnish I also recommend the Liquitex brand because it goes on really nice and thickly and it's very flexible so if this mask is flexed it won't crack 
So that's why I recommend the more expensive Liquitex varnish. You'll also need a, a brush to apply it with. This is just an old retired acrylic brush of mine. And it actually has softer bristles. Because you don't want a brush with really stiff bristles because when you're painting, it could pull up some of the dye. So you, you just want a soft bristle brush. Then I have a paper towel here to dab the brush off if I get too much water in the brush. Because you don't want to make your varnish runny. And I also have just a container to hold the varnish in, which is a, I can't believe it's not butter container. And uh, I save these things. They're really handy. Now, before you start, you're going to want to shake this for at least 30 seconds, because if you don't shake it, you might end up with some cloudiness in your varnish. So, first we shake it. That should be enough. And you just want to pour, just pour a little bit in here. You don't really need a lot. And I always start with a little bit. You just soak your bristles. You don't want it to uh, load up your brush too heavily because then you'll just glob the varnish on there. You want a thin, even application of this. We're just lightly brushing it over the surface. You can sort of overlap your strokes so you don't get any brush strokes. And another great thing about varnish is it brings out the contrast of your piece. So it's really popping the colors right now. And I don't like to varnish the backs of my masks because some people are allergic to this stuff. So I don't, I just leave the, the back of the mask bare where it's going to touch the face so people won't have allergic reactions. That's the last thing you want a mask wearer to have. Now that the varnish is dry, we're ready to put the final touch on this mask, which is to get some elastic bands so that it can be affixed to the face. What you'll need for this step is elastic. This is just eighth of an inch braided elastic that I got from my local hobby store. You'll also need a hole punch to make your holes. I have it on the very smallest setting because I want to make very small holes. And I bought this rotary hole punch from Tandy. And the way you figure out where to poke your holes is that you need to basically come from the corner of the eye to where the side of the mask is going to have the most tension against the face where the band is pulling the mask onto the face towards the ear. So I'm going to make two small holes here that are lining up with the corner of the eye. And I'll show you why I make two small holes in a bit. Takes a little elbow grease. Now the reason I have two holes is because I like to loop the elastic so that it goes around the head twice. And I'll show you why. So now you can see I just have two strands here and what that does is that a wearer can tighten the mask by tying a knot here so they can adjust this mask some instead of just having a finite strand that they would have to replace later once the elastic gets slack. And the way this looks from the front are just little 
little loops here in the uh, in the mask. It's unimposing. So you just cut off the strand at the length that you want. I usually use my own head as a as a scale reference. And uh, once you're done with that, you can just burn the ends of the elastic so they don't unravel, or use super glue. And I like to put a little signature here. I just burn it in with a wood burner. So I'll probably put a title and my signature on the other side. I don't like to use a pin to sign the inside of mask because that can rub off on a user's face as well. But just tie this off and this mask is ready for a night on the town. Well here we are at the finish line. It's been about a four or five hour process and hopefully you can begin to see why leather masks demand such a high price tag. But trust me when I say that the results are awesome. Leather is such a great material to work with, and it, the sky is the limit with your imagination and leather. I've signed this mask on the back with a wood burner. The title is Tarot the Sun. You can see also I have an elastic knot here, so I can adjust this mask to any size. Now, I'm ready for the masquerade, are you? Hopefully this tutorial has given you an insight on the process. Thank you for joining me. If you'd like to find out more tips and tricks, I have a YouTube channel. My username is Angelic Shades. I also have more masks online at www.angelicartisan.com. I hope you'll join me for the future. Thank you for watching.